Hey everybody. So I was um, looking on the internet and found these pictures that are a great illustration of a dynamic from a previous reading, right? The role of Matsutake as gifts in Japan. And look at how these um, photographs are, uh, look at how in the photograph you have the mushrooms that are presented in these fancy boxes that are wrapped with just a couple in each box. They're very expensive, and they're sold in this what appears to be a kind of specialty store, right? These are things you can buy at these specialty grocers at times, um, but they are that are already packaged for you to give them as gifts. In this, in today's readings, you finished up the last section and then started a new section on um, the science of Matsu uh, Matsutake's and the anthropology of that science. So the first chapter you read was to wrap up the previous section, and it was the chapter on ruin. This is um, one of my favorite chapters in the book. It's one of the chapters I use in my research. And what is particularly useful about the way Singh thinks about ruins is that capitalism and progress narratives produce ruins. That's how capitalism works. Capitalism is a practice of producing ruins. We've talked about that some in previous classes, right? But the core of it is that no places that are no longer profitable get abandoned, whether these are timber forests as prices drop or malls or any number of things. Capitalism is the process of extracting profit and when that profitability runs out, letting those things fall into ruin and moving to the next point of profit. Now, in terms of Matsutake for, um, forests, what we're really looking at here is the collapse of the timber market in the 80s and 90s. And this moment in which suddenly these massive stands of pine trees that um, loggers had been hoping to cultivate and um and clear cut in order to sell for timber. We've talked in previous classes about the problems in the management strategies that presumed the ability to rationally manage these forests in a way that really disrupted um, ponderosa pine ecological relationships and allowed for new forests to emerge. However, in the 1980s and 1990s, you further see the collapse of the timber market. And it is no longer profitable for timber companies to harvest wood. It's no longer profitable for them to maintain forests by spraying for pesticide, spraying pesticides. Um, and so these entire forests that have been cultivated by these commercial interests are abandoned. And so what um, I'm sorry, what Singh is saying is that these entire forests are landscapes of ruin. And what she says is what's really interesting to her is that um, there's this wholesale, interconnected, and seemingly unstoppable ruination of forests across the world, such that even the most geographically, biologically, and culturally disparate forces are still linked in a chain of destruction. How is it that we see this ruination happen in Japan, in the um, Western North America? in um, Southeastern Asia, right? We see these patterns of forests as, ru uh, the ruination of forests and forests as ruin spreading across the globe, across geographical and biologically and ecologically distinct contexts and culturally distinct contexts. So when we talk about ruins, I wanna think a little bit about how this relates to the core questions of this class, right? And I want to think about another theorist of ruins um, who argues that when we look at the ruins of, quote unquote, the modern world, we have something that's really uncanny. We have this kind of tension between these ideas that were supposed to be these spaces that were all about cultivating these um, um, this sense of modernity, these shiny auras of capitalism. Um, of newness, of progress, right? I don't know if y'all are old enough to really go to malls, but when I was a kid, that was like where you hung out. And malls are brightly lit. They are full of, um, you know, the newest technology, games, 
um, clothing, highest, high, not high fashion, I mean, where, I'm not that classy, but, you know, fashion for people who, somewhere between thrift stores and buy, I don't know, you, you get the idea. Um, you know, you go to the mall and you go to the Apple store where they have these new uh, cutting edge technology on display, right? There's this whole aura of progress and new technology, cutting edge fashion that's all put on display. It's all produced through these technologies of display. And so what this theorist um, argues is that then there's this uncanniness that happens when those spaces themselves fall into ruins, when malls um, are overtaken by foliage, like in these pictures I have for you. And I think that uncanniness, that moment in which modernity falls into ruin, is useful for us to think about. And when we think about capitalism, right, the funny thing about capitalism is in order for capitalism to constantly producing something that's new and advanced, you have to also constantly break from the past. You, also, you have to advance on what was before. We see this, for example, in timed obsolescence, the ways your phones break so you have to buy a new one. There's this accumulation of waste and ruin that is integral to capitalism. You always have to get people to be invested in buying the newest model. And even by constructing this very image of progress, this very image of newness, this very image of breaking from an older past, in order to do that, what you're over, you have to do over and over again is whatever's new becomes tomorrow's outdated technology. One way to think about this is the kinds of ways that people used to imagine the future 50 or 100 years ago. Um, I don't know if y'all have seen The Jetsons. The Jetsons was a cartoon, um, I think from the 60s. Uh, it's Hanna-Barbera, which I don't even know if they make cartoons anymore. Anyway, The Jetsons was this, you know, heteronormative family with two children and a dog and um, a robot maid who lived in the future, flew, flew around in their, their airplane car, their futuristic airplane car, in these buildings that towered in the sky. And so this is this, um, and it's this funny thing, right? There's, again, this uncanniness that we see when we um, look at this from 2020. What does a future imagined 60 years ago? It looks silly and outdated. Um, it's, it's kitschy, it's cute. The robot, the space car, right? It's, um, it's a vision of the future from 60 years ago. That's uncanny. There's this tension that's created in the continual need to reimagine the future while also breaking from the past over and over and over again. And that tension is integral to both progress narratives and it's integral to um, capitalism. And it's a process that, repro that continuously reproduces, I'm sorry, produces spaces of ruin. Now in this future, um, you know, it's the 60s, right? So the husband works and um, the wife stays at home, the kids go to school. But, you know, like, the husband is stuck in space traffic. I mean, it's not space traffic, so in airway traffic. Um, works at a menial, meaning, meaningless job where he's harassed by his, um, his boss, who is just always angry with him. Um, basically does whatever he's, to whatever he's told. You know, it's a comedy, though, and it's kind of... This 60s kind of, haha, here is the family and all the kind of bullshit we have to put up with in a daily, um, in a daily, as part of our daily existence, but set in the future. This is what people thought the future might look like back then. Or we can look at steampunk, right? This kind of aesthetic imagining of a future that instead of that instead of reflecting the historical shift to fuel fossil fuels instead a society 
or an alternative future that emerges from the flourishing of steam-based technology and clockwork-based technologies. Again, we see this dynamic, right, of imagining alternative futures as, um, that are grounded in these kinds of um, previous moments. And there's this uncanniness in this creation of something that's both past-like and futuristic. And so I want to use this kind of idea of retro futures as a way of also thinking about Matsutake mushrooms and ruins. How do these retro futures help us think through capitalism as a process of producing ruins, through these um, logics of abandonment, of extracting resources as when there's, and when there's no more profit to be had, abandoning those sites um, into ruin? And how, does, how do retro futures help us imagine a world in that a world where we can live in those ruins, whether an anthropology of an of a world on fire, or even just life in a world on fire. So coming back to Matsutake mushrooms, we often think of ruins as collapsing buildings, but they are also forests filled with Matsutake. This is one of my favorite pic pictures of malls falling into ruin. But seeing is calling on us to, on the one hand, expand our understanding of ruins. Forests can be spaces of ruin in that they are abandoned by capitalism when they are no longer profitable, in the same way malls are. And she's also demanding us to think of ruination not as something that just happens, right? It's not just that places are ruins, but rather Ruination is an integral process of capitalism, whether it's producing spaces that become abandoned when they're no longer profitable, or um, through this process of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Through a process of labeling things as ruins, um, labeling, producing a past, culturally constructing a past that is fundamentally different from the, from the contemporary modern present and that the present breaks from, right? The reason why there are so many, I mean, one of the reasons why there are so many historic sites where the state invests in preserving quote unquote ruins is in order to construct these spaces as ruins, as a way of distinguishing um, them from the spaces of contemporary life, spaces of futurity like malls, like iPhones, um, because of course the reality is that iPhones and malls and, um, the collapsing walls of the Colosseum all exist in 2020, right? Like there's no one that's more pasty than the other when you look at it that way. But we create this cultural construction or illusion of pastness and futurity that we integrate, that we grant, that we, um, invest in our spaces, invest in our material culture in order to construct this narrative that there is somehow um, something like progress that's always on the edge of the future that is distinctive from these other spaces of ruin. And what Singh is saying is, no, 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 that's not what ruination is. Ruination is not the Colosseum. Ruination is capitalism. And so she writes, the effects of industrial ruins on living things depends on, on which living things to follow. For some insects and parasites, ruined industrial forests provi proved a bonanza. For other species, the rationalization of the forest itself before ruination proved disastrous. Somewhere between these extremes lie the world-building proclivities of Matsutake. So, you know, ruination is a complex, ambiguous process. For some, it's fantastic. For others, it's devastating. For some, it's workable. And as Anna Singh says, um, to know the world that progress has left us, we must track shifting patches of ruination. I love that quote. So when we talk about ruined industrial forests, like in Oregon, or in Japan, or in Southeast Asia, we're talking about places that have been constructed through many different histories, different cultural contexts, different ecological contexts. 
At the same time, there are these interesting convergences that we see again and again that have to do with the operations of capital in terms of the extraction of value of profit from forests and the state in terms of these bureaucratic regimes of managing natural resources and the ways in which capital and the state um, rely on and cater to each other. We see this pattern again and again and again, even in the context of these multiple histories. And that's something Anna Singh is interested in. Why do we see this pattern again and again and again? How do we explain that when the context, when the ecologies are so different? In um, the next section, Singh turns to the anthropology of the science of Matsuotake. And the first chapter is science is translation. And she's arguing that science is itself about translation. And as such, science is messy. Um, there are multiple sciences, there are multiple Matsutake sciences that emerge out of different um, national traditions. Which is a really funny thing, right? Because like culture, cultural practices, ideologies, as well as ecologies and Matsutake, things like Matsutake spores don't follow national boundaries in a neat way. And yet the role of the state has been such that there does emerge these nat national scientific transitions. I'm sorry, traditions. And so as such, right, there's no unified system of knowledge and practice here. It, there's just this messy process of translation or what Singh calls patches of incoherence and incompatibility in science. So how do we explain this? How do we understand these differences? Well, there's a lot of historical differences in how these um, scientific initiatives were uh, came into came to be. Um, Matsutake studies in Japan came with different questions, assumptions, and approaches than similar sciences in the United States or in Korea or in China. Part of this we is due to an institutional basis. Research on Matsutake tend to be tied to state-sponsored state forestry industry institutes, in which, as Singh says, Matsutake is a science, I'm sorry, we're talking about a science of state governance, the science of governing natural resources. And those, and while there's parallels, there's convergences in terms of how these state operate, states operate, we're also looking at government institutions with very different cultural assumptions, assumptions about the nature of nature, and understandings of the goals and objects uh, at, at hand. So we have scientists asking different questions from different frameworks. There are different ontological assumptions, or there's different assumptions, as I said, about nature or the moral weight of human disturbances. Um, as we read in previous chapters, right, in Japan, conservation often says that human disturbance is based, is a good thing in terms of conservation. In the U.S., the standard of conservation is limiting human disturbance. These different moral frameworks are rooted in radically different assumptions about what nature is as a cultural construct, what nature is and what are humans' relationships to nature. So these assumptions shape very different scientific projects. There's also different methodologies based on fundamentally different understandings of things like the site of study. I'll get to that in a second, right? But what I, the, 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 the impact is that um, the studies themselves are not actually commensurable with one another. You can't simply compare them easily because the, they're based out of different questions and methodologies. And the th they don't take the same assumptions and frameworks for granted. This is such an important insight in science studies, right? Which is just that often we can't compare different studies because the methodology is so different. And we need to understand that methodological difference to really understand how these things relate to each other. Now in the image, what I have is the part of the mushroom that 
is engaged in the mutualistic or benef mutually beneficial relationship with the roots of certain pine trees. I forget the name of this part of the mushroom, but this is the way the mushroom, this is the piece of the mushroom and the roots that interact with each other. So there's my picture of science. I could have given you a DNA, I guess. So we're talking about tra science and traditions within science with different methodologies, different assumptions, different questions. And, one, and so Singh, to elucidate, elucidate this, turns to a statement that a Pacific Northwest researcher told her, that Japanese studies are not very useful because they are descriptive. And so Anna Singh says we have to actually untangle what descriptive might mean and what's wrong with it. We can't take that description of Japanese studies as descriptive um, for granted. We have to ask what does descriptive mean in this context and why is it a bad thing? And to understand it is to expose the cultural and historical specificity of the U.S. forestry research. And Singh observes that when U.S.-based researchers say Japanese research is too descriptive, what they mean is it's site-specific. That is, attuned to the indeterminate encounters and thus is non-scalable. Because, because these studies are based, are, are focused on the specific encounters and relationships of a site, the concern for Pacific Northwestern researchers is that it is not scalable. Whereas U.S. management of timber trees is the fundamental, uh, I'm sorry, U.S. forestry researchers are under pressure to develop analyses compatible with the scalable management of timber trees. Site selection in Japanese research pet follows patches of fungal growth, not timber grids. In other words, U.S. researchers are looking at grids of timber, um, timber, timber, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyway, grids of timber trees um, as the basic unit of what a site is. And so they're looking at mushrooms through this framework of timber grids, of um, yeah, uh, uh, not timber groves, timber stands. And as such, whereas Japanese researchers are following patches of fungal growth, right? They're interested in the Matsutake. And it's not that even that there are corporations that are necessarily saying, foresters, you need to pay attention to the grids. Um, this is what you're supposed to be doing. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but that's not necessary for the explanation. Rather, it's that US science, the questions that US scientists are asking and the ways they approach the landscape is organized through the cultural concept of timber trees rather than the fungal patch. And that this is a different orientation to the site. And so Japanese researchers and US researchers are talking about fundamentally different things. And they, these frameworks don't scale into one another. U.S.-based researchers are not interested in following the threads of fungal growth. They're interested in the scalability of timber as a resource. Thus, the stand, the unit of manageable timber, is the basic landscape unit that U.S. foresters can see. The fungal patch ecology studied by Japanese scientists do not register on this grid. The timber stand is the basic landscape unit. It's the thing foresters see. Fungal patch ecologies are not visible. They're not legible within the framework of the timber stand. Likewise, US-based studies are asking the question, are pickers destroying the resource? This is, they ask the same question about logging, right? Does logging destroy the research? The, I'm sorry, the resource. And this is very different, right, than the other kinds of questions that could be asked, the questions that Singh is asking based on Japanese research. What about other forms of human disturbance? Thinning, fire suppressing, silver culture. How has fire suppression affected or affected the resource, right? Because that's already a disturbance. And those are questions that haven't been studied in the same way because it doesn't jump to the minds of researchers worried about over-harvesting. 
In other words, the questions that US-based scientists are asking are rooted in the fundamental assumption that human disturbance destroys natural resources. As such, they're asking, are pickers destroying the resource, rather than thinking about the multiple forms of disturbances and the effects these have on mushroom harvesting. And so within these scientific traditions, again, we're seeing multiple methodologies rooted in different understandings of what the quote unquote, what the site is. Different questions, different assumptions about the nature of nature, all of which makes it difficult to translate between these studies. That said, there's also these wonderful moments where scientists come together across these traditions and talk with each other, such as the International Stu um, Matsutake Studies Conference in 2011. And as Singh writes, we each had completely different ideas about the point of Matsutake studies. We had different agendas. Yet in two days of joint fieldwork, we reached each other, we watched each other watching the forests. It was an amazing opportunity to see several kinds of science and action performed simultaneously. So here's this moment where there are all of these researchers, Japanese researchers, Korean researchers, Chinese researchers, some US-based researchers in the social studies of science, the anthropology of science, but there are also silences. There was no one from the US forester, forestry services because uh, the US government had cut foresting resources, and so they didn't have the funds to go to these conferences for something like mushrooms. And so in this dynamic, right, as Singh is, is um, observing, there are these multiple agendas, right? She writes that Chinese scientists hope to promote Chinese Matsuitake. Um, Japanese participants were really excited about the chance to, to, to look at um, Matsuotake from different geographical contexts. North Koreans wanted copies of international scientific articles, which they couldn't access from um, at their homes. Um, and then there are these North American anthropologists thinking about the relationship between science and society. And she says, we all had different agendas, but no one here thought that this was a waste of time. Everyone got things out of it even if they were different things based in different questions, orientations, and concerns. And so as, Singh's right, as Anna Singh writes, cosmopolitan science is composed of patches and is richer for it. Science is not monolithic. There is no one science here. There are multiple. It is, it's patchy. And that's a good thing. It's complicated. It's a little easier. It's a little harder than a science that's scalable, where every study is commensurable um, with every other study. But sometimes, as Singh reminds us, heterogeneity is a good thing. Adaptability to specific contexts can be a good thing. The next chapter is flying spores. Spores for Tsing are a metaphor. They are a image of um, that she thinks is useful to think about, specifically the way spores draw our attention to movement and movement that's really hard to pin down. Um, spores are very hard to see for the most part. And as she writes, both, forest, both in forest and in science, spores open our imaginations to another cosmopolitan topography. That's a lovely little phrase, right? Opening our imagination to another cosmopolitan topo topology. Another way of thinking about and understanding space and global interconnection. And so this image, right, gives us what Singh, would, Singh describes as indeterminate and global movement, as well as heterogeneity even within the body of Matsutake mushrooms themselves. I'm sorry, not the mushrooms, but the fungus themselves this kind of funny dynamic that I'll get to in a moment in which ma mushrooms don't really fit into the concept we have of species. But also the pleasures of speculation, these speculative narratives. How did Matsutake spread across the globe? 
And Singh ends with this other poetic point. Um, patches are productive, but there are also spores. I don't know exactly how to interpret it, but I really love that quote. I like this idea of patches as being productive, um, right? She, patches are both useful for Singh to think about, and they're also ecologically rich. But then there are spores, which are not fixed within the patch. Spores travel. And so there's this relationship between the patchy location and the, and the, 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 the transient spore, the nomadic spore. In this chapter, Singh covers DNA science of Matsutake, as well as multiple speculative models of how the mushrooms spread across the globe. Um, models ranging from human trade and travel to movement of ecosystems to spores that travel in the upper stratosphere um, of the um, atmosphere. Which, you know, there are spores up there and they get blown around across the globe. And there's also a lot of insects buffed over. Anyway, I'm not, sorry, I don't need to info dump about ecologies of the upper stratosphere. Um, very interesting subject that I can talk about a different day, maybe. If you have forgotten some info about mushroom biology from, I don't know, middle school or high school biology, I don't know when you learned this, I don't know when I learned it. Um, here's a little diagram of the mushroom life cycle. Mushrooms are kind of funny in that there's the, the fruit, the mushroom itself, which releases a spore. The spore is a kind of form of sexual reproduction that forms this thing called the uh, mycelial expansion. Mycelia is kind of a fungal network, I guess you could call it, that spreads through the ground. And the mycelium is what um, gives rise to the fruit, which then gives the spore. So one of the things that happens when we think about fungus is that the concept of species doesn't really make that much sense. At Singh writes, defining individuals becomes difficult as these individuals contain many genetic signatures, helping the fungus adapt to new environmental situations. Species are open-ended when even, species are open-ended when even individuals are so molten, so long-lived, and so unwilling to draw lines of reproductive isolation. What does that mean? She gives us a bunch of quotes to exp to think about. Basically, fungus does not fit within the models of reproduction that are based on sexual animal behavior. And the very framework of species, which has traditionally been defined as the ability to produce offspring that are themselves fertile, and has been refined, I'm sorry, not refined, has been redefined by DNA studies as existing within a threshold of 5% genetic variation, which is, by the way, like super arbitrary. Fungi just don't operate in these kinds of frameworks. It just, these, the concept of species just doesn't make any fucking sense with them. So um, one scientist talks about a kind of root rot that's actually 50 species in one species. It depends on how you're dividing species for on what you're defining species for. Mycelium can have many different genetic signatures. It can be what Singh calls a mosaic body, a mosaic of multiple species, of multiple genetic compositions, of multiple individuals. There's also this phenomenon called di daimon mating, um, which Singh says is that it's as if I decided to mate with and not clone my own arm. So what the fuck does that mean? Um, I don't totally understand it because it's so fucking weird to me with my animal-centric worldview that I actually have trouble understanding what daimon mating is um, because it's hard for me to imagine that it really exists. But that's, again, because I have a very animal-centric perspective that I'm trying to unlearn here. And so what is daimon mating, right? Daimon mating has to do with the spores being released, which um, release into, uh, the, the spores are haplic, if I'm remembering my high school biology right, haptic, 
Um, you will not be tested on that, which means, right, if you remember cellular biology, um, these are sexual these are sexual cells like sperm and egg that include only half of the genetic pairs that a living organism is required to have. And so when sperm and egg meet each other, they each have half of the genetic code, and so they create the whole. Um, Daimon mating, so when, when uh, mushrooms can do, um, mushrooms can do, they can clone, but they can also um, do sexual reproduction in which spores meet each other and complement each other and provide the whole, um, both pairs of chromosomes required for an individual. However, um, spores can also fertilize um, what's called, um, I think, the mycelium, but what is described as the shiro in the book. The shiro, this is a picture of the shiro. Um, the picture on the screen is a picture of shiro. And because the shiro itself has multiple genetic sequences, is multiple individuals, is multiple even species from certain ways of looking at it, there's a way in which this, the spy, the, 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 um, the spore cells can fertilize the, the spiro of a different, I'm sorry, the shiro of different um whatever that root system were. i'm sorry you're seeing the limits of my understanding of of um mushroom biology please don't like argue because you're an anthropology professor like if you have a biology professor saying like here's how this stuff works and it contradicts what i say like i'm not a fucking biology professor like go with them um this is just but it's also interesting stuff to think with it's interesting in on a metaphorical level it's interesting in a lot of ways. It's interesting in the way it exposes the cult, the problems with this cultural concept of species. Anyway, the spores can also mate with the um, can spate, can, I'm sorry, can um, mate with the um, mycelium of their own dang bodies, right? And then can produce new individuals because the mycelium is itself multiple individuals. Um, it can produce novel genetic um, forms or sequences. And so anyway, this is just a super weird process, daimon mating. It is um, in which a mycelium can mate with itself through the spore in a way that's kind of sexual and involves the union of the um, cell with just one set of chromosomes and cells with two sets of chromosomes. Um, very unlike how animal sex works. So, the, so this concept of species just makes no sense in this in this sense in this context in the context of fungi. And um, seeing I interviewed another researcher who said the problem with the old taxonomic approach is you say this is my ideal. It's completely platonic, meaning you have an ideal, an abstract ideal, and you're expecting the world to be a reflection of your abstract ideal. And then everything is going to compare as a missed approximation to that ideal. So you have the ideal type of the species, Matsutake. Then every actual existing Matsutake then is a mixed approximation of that ideal. And if the thing becomes too different, if the approximation is too missed by whatever measure we're using, which is also the measure we use is also arbitrary, then you say, oh, this must be a different species. So the scientist's problem is the concept of species is just too fucking arbitrary. And they say, in fungi, we just have no idea what species is. No idea. A species is a group of organisms that can potentially exchange genetic material, can have sex. That applies to organisms that reproduce sexually. So already in plants, we, when you have a clone, you can, which you can have change in which as time goes by, you have problems with that species. So again, even plants throw a wrench into our concept of species. Secondly, if you move out of vertebrates into corals and worms, and the exchange of DNA 
and the exchange of DNA and the way um, groups are made that are very different from us. And you go from fung you go even further to fungi and bacteria, and you have the systems that are totally different. Um, you can have, you can have long lived clones that all of a sudden go sexual. You can have hybridization in which whole big chunks of chromosomes are brought chromosomes are brought in. You can have something called polypoid blah, blah 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 in which duplication of chromosomes there's a duplication of chromosomes there is a and something new comes out. You can have symbiotization in which you might capture a bacterium that allows you to either use the whole bacterium as a part of yourself or use parts of that bacterium for DNA that you can incorporate into your own genome and become something totally different that way. So where do you draw the break between species within this framework, right? Species is a concept that is not relevant for, it's um, a concept developed in reference to animal sexual reproduction that falls apart in the context of mushrooms. And I think this is useful to think about, right? Because like, it's a great example of these kinds of cultural concepts that we expect from science that are actually very loose and difficult. Um, but I also keep thinking about, as I talk about this, I keep thinking about mycelium, which I'll talk about in the next slide. So the species concept is doesn't make a lot of sense, according to these scientists, which is interesting. It's interesting as an anthropologist to think about where these concepts break down. But mycelium is also a really interesting metaphor that gets used in a lot of pop culture, like sensate, to think about other forms of consciousness that are not premised upon difference, the idea that you and me are different bodies, are different people, are different persons, are separate entities, and rather mycelium as a framework for thinking about these hidden modes of connection, these hidden um, realities, hidden literally in the sense that mycelium exists under the dirt, which then crops into the surface through things like mushroom, mushroom fruits, um, which gives rise to these surface level things that appear different. And yet, as creatures, this is the sensate kind of story, which is science fiction, right? This is I move from science to science fiction. Mycelium becomes a metaphor for these forms of interconnectivity, um, these modes of being in which who you are is always also all these other people, and they're a part of you and you're a part of them. That's the way mushrooms are, right? Mushrooms are fucking sensates. Sure, I mean, again, don't go say that to a biology professor and get upset with me when they're like, first of all, like, I don't, I don't know what you're saying and know that's a simplification. I'm, I'm saying a point for rhetorical force. I do not have the biological background to say for sure that mushrooms are sensates. I don't even know what that means. Anyway, the point I'm making is that mycelium is a metaphor used in pop culture to generate new kinds of concepts and ways of thinking. It's good to think with. The last piece of the reading is the interlude. One of the things I love about this is in the previous chapters, Singh has talked so much about scientific forms of knowledge, the production of scientific knowledge and these problems of translation and the failure of scalability in thinking through these um, different scientific traditions. In contrast, when she talks about mushroom pickers, she talks about embodied knowledge. She talks about ways of sensing Matsuotake, using your whole body and all your senses. And as a process that's very much about embodiment and movement as a way of knowing. So what is embodied knowledge? Singh writes, some pickers mention that they pay attention to the dirt, favoring areas where, one, where the soil looks right. But when I ask for specifications, they always demur. One picker was probably tired of my asking, and so he explained the right kind of soil where Matsuotake, the right kind of soil is where Matsuotake grows. So much for classification. Discourse has limits. This is what embodied knowledge is. It's knowledge that can't always be explained. 
put into language or words. It's knowledge that we hold in our bodies. Matsutake pickers know how to find the mushrooms. They know it through experience. They know it because that knowledge is in their body. This is the difference then from a architect that designs and creates a plan and a model for a wall and an artesian stone carver who forms the stone by hand knows how to do it but can't necessarily write an instruction manual for someone else. They can teach someone else but they teach through apprenticeship. They teach this process of doing, working by doing, learning by doing. That's embodied knowledge. It's a kind of knowledge that is not necessarily put into discourse or classification. And what a contrast with this, these scientific approaches. One of um, Singh's hosts describes having this wash of memory. What a nice turn of phrase, a wash of memory. It's this moment when you go through, you're walking through a part of a forest and you suddenly the, the place just looks familiar and you remember finding a mushroom here another year and you're just washed over by this memory. This is a kind of memory, as Singh says, that requires motion and inspires an intimate historical knowledge of the forest. It's a kind of knowledge that's not scalable because again, it lives in the body. In this kind of work of finding places where Matsutake were found in the past, is a generative way of finding Matsutake again. The mushrooms tend to crop up where they had cropped up before. And so here Singh is thinking about lines of movement, the ways the lines people travel through the forest as a way of knowing. She calls these activity lines, and you can follow the activity lines of others, both humans and non-humans. Deer often like to eat Matsutake, so you can follow the activity lines of beer. I'm sorry, of deer, to find that forest. Or you can find trash left by certain people um, who were picking before you to find good spots. This kind of trash that is often derided by um, white conservationists as disruptive of the ecology, as um, disrupting the beauty of the place is very useful for Matsutake pickers. So this is dancing. Dancing is a metaphor for sing, for a way of knowing that lives in your body and lives through movement in the landscape. Now go forth and discuss. Here are some questions for y'all to think through. If you would like to think, talk about a different topic that's not in my questions, go for it. <laughs>